through the, the different chapters, the different components of this project. So this is titled Transnational Afterlife, um, the Political Life Cycle of Emigrante. And in order to sort of uh, the topic and, and the, the central question driving this research, uh, allow me to begin by uh, reading directly from, from the, uh, the preface of the book manuscript. Uh, so this is one of the more memorable experiences from my ethnographic field research in uh, the migrant setting in the south of North Central and the state of Zacatecas. This, this project entailed transnational ethnographic research between these migrant sending regions in Mexico and immigrant destinations, uh, mainly in California, Southern California and Northern California. So, so, so this is uh, from, uh, from my field, uh, field notes. It was the closing day of Guadalupe Gomez's campaign for a seat in Mexico's federal Congress in the midterm elections of summer 2009. A resident of Orange County, California, Gomez was the only person in Mexico to run as a migrant candidate, doing so with the right of center Partido Acción Nacional in his home state of Zacatecas. Like Gomez, I, I had traveled from Southern California to Zacatecas to shadow the migratician as he took the campaign trail. It had been an intense summer of campaigning in the migrant municipalities of Zacatecas and its remote ranchos or villages. The state that, like the candidate, my own parents had left for the U.S. in search of work decades earlier. On the final day of the campaign, I traveled to the municipality of Genaro Colina to attend Gomez's last speech before driving back two hours to the district seat for the official closing rally there. The These are uh, some images I took of the charming, picturesque town of Genaro Colina, which was recently profiled in the New York Times article uh, regarding depopulation due to sustained out-migration to the U.S. <coughs> As Gomez delivered his speech and subsequently shook hands and collected the grievances of the gathered crowd, mostly local campesinos, to supplement their livelihood with remittances from the U.S., I reached over to the migrant candidate and uttered that I would get a head start back to the district seat to await his grand finale later that night. By that point, I had become such a fixture in Gomez's campaign events that he began publicly acknowledging the presence of a U.S. academic in his speeches. So here's the migrant candidate, Lupe Gomez, working, working the crowd. So I took to the road the satisfaction that came on the closing day of what turned out to be a, com a competitive campaign for the American candidate. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that further up the highway, I would find myself quite literally in the wrong place at the, at the wrong time. This is where it gets good. <laughs> <laughs> Un unbeknownst to me, as we wrapped up Gomez's closing campaign event, a gun battle had unfolded between members of the Mexican army and cartel henchmen in a community not far from Canal Colina. As luck would have it, I approached that community precisely as one of the cartel gunmen was trying to make an escape. I slowed my vehicle as I neared the speed bumps, the only barrier that allows local villagers to cross the narrow two-lane highway. A man stood by the side of the road and slowly began to cross. I made nothing of it at first until the man stopped in the middle of the lane, reached for his waistband, pulled out a handgun, and aimed it directly at me, flinching. As my vehicle was coming to a halt, I realized that the gunman was in urgent need of a getaway vehicle, his face covered in blood. Well aware of the modus operandi of these roving armed vans, my immediate reaction was to not surrender my vehicle, and instead <laughs> swerve out of his line of fire and speed away, hoping for the best. <laughs> I wasn't going to give up my truck. That, that is <laughs> I put my truck in gear, turned the wheel, and ducked, expecting to, he to hear the blast from the gun and the shattering of glass as I sped past him. Yet, there was nothing. As I looked up into my rearview rear, rear mirror, adrenaline rushing through my body, I realized that the subject was out of ammunition, effectively having emptied out his rounds in the gun battle with the soldiers. My immediate thought was of the candidate who was coming, com coming up the highway, and for a split second, I considered turning around and confronting the injured suspect. <laughs> Seeing a federal police patrol car racing down the highway instead, I continued driving and I called uh, Gomez directly to alert him of the scene up the road. <laughs> what exactly were Gomez and I, two residents of Southern California, doing there? To the critics, Gomez was there perhaps for the spoils of office, and I, the academic, was there to document and study Mexican migrants' incursion into their, increasingly, into, into their homeland's increasingly troubled politics. Yet, despite some political and ideological differences between the two, the two of us, I, for one, am no, no banista. No disrespect to my friend Lupe. But I believe Gomez and I were there for the same reason. Call me a diasporic romantic, but as Gomez put it on a separate occasion, we were both there because tenemos nuestro corazón allá. Our heart is over there. Over the course of the last 30 years, Lupe Gomez has uh, lived, established, and operated a successful business and raised a family 
in Orange County, California. This is Lupe on the front page of Orange County Weekly who ran a story on his transnational activism. So Lupe is clearly a fixture in the Latino community in Orange County. He's also a naturalized US citizen and a registered Democrat. Um, as a successful business owner, Lupe likes to say that he has the mind of a Republican when it comes to cutting taxes, but is a Democrat at heart uh, because of his commitment to social justice and the social safety net. Uh, this degree of migrant social, economic, and political integration in the U.S. notwithstanding, Lupe Gomez has clearly maintained strong ties to his community and country of origin. He's been an active member of uh, hometown associations in Southern California from the state of Zacatecas. He's the, he's the past president of the Zacatecas Federation in L.A., one of the largest, most, you know, most studied hometown associations. <laughs> uh, and as I just mentioned, in the 2009 congressional elections, he was the only person to run uh, as a U.S.-based migrant candidate for a single-member district seat uh, in, in Mexico's federal Congress. Um, so this political uh, bifocality, this civic binationality, these, these forms of transnational subjectivities and transnational citizenship are, are what I'm trying to explain in this book project. Now, there are a number of studies that have focused precisely on these migrant activists and the transnational coalitions and alliances that they've stitched together uh, as well as a number of really great um, you know, case studies on transnational communities. Uh, Sandy Nichols, who is, who is in the audience today, has written my, my, favorite, my favorite case study of one such community. Of course, I'm biased because it's, it's a study of a community where my family comes from. Um, but I think these studies have highlighted the, the, the significance of, of place in these transnational connections, place of origin, place of, of settlement in the, U, in the US, and the significance of peoplehood the migrant networks, the migrant social and family networks that sustain and lubricate these transnational connections and transnational circulations. What I try to do in this book is uh, expand on the significance of place and peoplehood uh, to include the significance of political process. Uh, specifically what I call, what I think of as the migrant political life cycle. And so I try to understand how these forms of transnational citizenship, these dual simult simultaneous engagements in the country of origin and the country of settlement, uh, how these ties can strengthen and unfold over this process. Uh, so in its, in, its, in its simplest form, the central question driving this, this project is how does transnational citizenship thicken? You can already see the UC Santa Cruz influence on me with this word thicken. That's totally from Johnny Fox. My, my um, so I, I'm, I'm seeking to understand the, the thickening of transnational citizenship over the different stages of this migrant political life cycle. What, what are those stages? Um, I begin with uh, the first stage, what I see as the first stage, uh, what, what's often referred to as the political baptism or migrants naturalization in the U.S. Uh, with an ethnographic account or assessment of how migrants uh, maintain strong transnational loyalties and strong attachments to their communities and country of origin, even as they're becoming U.S. citizens. Um, I, I then move to uh, the second phase of the migrant political life cycle, what I call the consummation of transnational citizenship by focusing on these, these, this select group of migrants who arguably best embody that duality, right? These migrant activists, these returned migrant politicians, I argue uh, their, their lives offer a window into understanding how, uh, understanding that process, the thickening of transnational citizenship, how migrants can develop and cultivate these simultaneous cross-border attachments and how that process can be mutually reinforcing rather than um, rather than uh, sort of mutually, mutually exclusive. Uh, and then finally, I move to uh, the last phase of that migrant political life cycle, what I call posthumous transnationalism, by looking at a particular form of, of, of transnationalism uh, that is the, 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 uh, the increasingly institutionalized practice of repatriating the bodies of deceased Mexican migrants from the US to their communities of origin in rural Mexico. Uh, as another, as further testament uh, of that transnational now, now, as another expression of the thickening of transnational citizenship. Um, so allow me to, to jump right in to, to this first stage um, with this chapter uh, that, that I've titled Consecrating Transnational Citizens, Mexican Narratives of Naturalization. Um, there, uh, in, in my subfield of Latino politics, uh, naturalization, citizenship acquisition is often, oftentimes referred to as the political baptism precisely because this is seen as migrants institutional initiation into the polity. It's their, it's, their, it's their initiation to formal political participation in the U.S., and it's the first step towards political enfranchisement therein. 
or as anthropologist Luis Plasencia puts it in his recent book on Mexican naturalization, this can be seen as migrants, uh, Mexican migrants entering the circle of citizenship. Now, uh, the studies in, in my subfield of, of Latino politics have, have done a really good job of documenting the relationship between an anti-immigrant political climate and uh, the decision to naturalize. So there's, there's an established pattern whereby uh, Mexican migrants, Latino migrants more generally, uh, seek naturalization in direct response to an immigrant hostile political climate as a strategy of political self-defense. So that, that's been uh, pretty, pretty well established primarily through these you know, large and quantitative studies on citizenship. What I try to do in this chapter is uh, unpack the naturalization process itself from the perspective of Mexican migrants as they collectively navigate the process. And I do that by conducting political ethnographies in citizenship classrooms uh, what I would, I would, I, an ideal site to understand how, how my, migrants perceive and understand and collectively navigate this, this institutional procedure, uh, the process of becoming a U.S. citizen. And this methodological approach also allows me to get at the central question of, of, that I'm interested in, which is what does naturalization mean for migrants' transnational identities and loyalties? It's another linkage that, that the current studies haven't fully uh, ex explained or understood. Um, the, the, other, the other advantage of this approach is that you know, this allows me to capture the stories behind the statistics, the narratives behind the naturalization numbers, and really do justice to uh, Mexican migrants' collective understanding of this process. Uh, so you know, one of my favorite um, uh, you know, field note entries is one that I titled Las Huellas de Don Juan, or Don Juan's imprints, where I, de where I describe one of my informants um, the trouble he had with his biometrics. And as, as part of the requirements of becoming a U.S. citizen, all applicants have to have their fingerprints taken to, to corroborate their identity before the state. Uh, well, unlike most migrants, Don Juan had trouble with his biometrics, having to get his fingerprints taken multiple times. Such was the damage sustained to his hands from the chemicals he handles at his factory workplace. His identity essentially eroded from his toiling, toiling anonymously in this country for decades, which I thought was ironically indicative of Mexican migrants' political condition less sort of alienated labor and illegible as potential citizens or unrecognizable as, as potential citizens. So that those, these types of experiences are what I what I try to understand and, and, and also uh, I try to assess how that impacts migrants' dual loyalties once they become once they obtain uh, U.S. citizenship. So in terms of the catalysts, what drives migrants to seek naturalization? A lot of what the, the literature on Latino politics has established was echoed is echoed in these classrooms, right? So there's a palpable fear fear of deportability. And, and uncertainty that comes with a, a precarious political environment that is often cited as one of the main causes for migrants' uh, uh, decision to naturalize. As, as one of my respondents, uh, one of my male respondents says, it's, it's urgent for us to do this because one day policymakers may decide to throw us all out. So this, this palpable fear of deportability was particularly pronounced among my female uh, informants, female uh, respondents. Who, particularly those who were in mixed status family uh, families and, and mixed status households. Uh, so one one woman uh, says, "Well, my family, my children are, are all U.S. citizens, and I am not," alluding to that ever-present fear of deportability and family separation. Um, another woman in, in the same focus group in, in Salina says, "I, as a mother, am becoming a citizen to vote and fight for the rights of my family, of my children who were born here." So. Um, Another sort of important trend or pattern that, that I see here is not, not only that, that migrants are seeking this sort of as a, as a strategy, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way to achieve a modicum of political stability in, the, in this, amidst this uh, uh, precarious political environment, but also as, as a part of a larger collective strategy for community empowerment and, and as a way to redress the, the broader needs uh, of the community writ large. Uh, uh, I call this uh, reactive naturalization. Uh, where again, this citizenship acquisition is no longer sort of just an individual act for you know, po you know political stability or security, but is part of this larger, larger uh, collective strategy of, of community uh, uh, empowerment. So one of my respondents in, in LA said, in LA says, the way I see it is that by becoming a citizen, I'll have more clout to defend the rights that many Latinos lack. So making an, ex an explicit connection to those to the fellow migrants who who lack the legal pathway to citizenship, right? Making making an explicit reference. Uh, or expression of solidarity with those migrants who, who are undocumented. Uh, and this is you know, uh, interesting considering some of the earlier research on Latino politics which found kind of a, a negative relationship between you know, migrants who were associated with undocumented folks were presumably less likely to be politically involved and politically engaged. What I find in, in, in this ethnography is that 
precisely because these folks were at one point themselves undocumented or because of their proximity to the experience of illegality, uh, they're, 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 they're treating naturalization as a collective strategy of, of uh, community empowerment. Um, so naturalization is not merely defensive, like the literature describes it, but can be described as reactive, producing a, quote, proactive reaction leading to more activity, uh, as Melissa Michelson and Maria Payares argue in their study of Mexican naturalization in Chicago. In terms of how migrants uh, collectively experience the citizenship process, you know, I often hear in these citizenship classrooms, migrants speak of U.S. citizenship as una ilusión, un sueño, right? People say they, they desire and dream of obtaining U.S. Citizen, citizenship. Well, in this political ethnography, I, I argue that these dreams of citizenship can turn out to be a naturalization nightmare because of the, the, the fear and anxiety that migrants perceive throughout this process. Uh, migrants often um, perceive this, this, uh, the citizenship acquisition process as, as bureaucratic, bureaucratically arbitrary and, 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 and institutionally discriminatory. Uh, you know, one of my one of my respondents says she was so consumed with her studying for the civic the, the citizenship test naturalization interview that she had dreams about the question. She says, "I stay up late at night studying studying, and I've had dreams about the immigration officer. He tells me I didn't pass. He tells me I have to come back. So there's this there's this this the understanding that this process is um, as, is marred and characterized by institutional discrimination, particularly uh, uh, by, towards Mexican migrants, and this is sort of infused by the stories, the narratives that people hear from other migrants who have had negative experiences with naturalization, people who have been turned away or rejected. I had one respondent uh, who shared his, his experience. Uh, he described his interaction with the immigration official as follows. He says, the immigration officers speak to you very fast and they want you to look, look them straight in the eye as if they're threatening you with their eyes. When one tries to respond to them, they've already stricken fear. So these negative encounters with naturalization infuse what I, what I call you know, this Mexican migrant mythology uh, of, of naturalization. And uh, I would argue that it, these negative encounters lead not only to you know, the, the, disenchant, the disenchanting citizenship, like Luis Placencia argues in his book, but also have direct uh, relevance for how migrants self-identify once they become citizens. Once they become US citizens, I, you, know, you can't expect migrants to sort of uncritically embrace the script of singular loyalties to the US when they feel that the process of, of naturalization itself is discriminatory. Um, and I, I should say that the, the, the negative encounters, these, these negative emotions throughout the process of fear and anxiety are oftentimes assuaged by the encouragement that, that migrants provide for one another in these citizenship classrooms and, and even in their family and social, and, and social networks. So one of the women that I interviewed, the only, the only, uh, sort of, uh, the only woman who I interviewed who was, who was uh, naturalizing alongside her husband uh, it offered an interesting example of this. Initially, you know, she was encouraging her husband to naturalize, and he was sort of like, he was reluctant. He's like, no, I don't want to do this. And she says, well, you know, she told him, no, we're bo we're both going to do it. If I become a citizen, I don't want you to remain a resident. I want one of us. I don't want one of us to be higher than the other, lower. I want both of us to be equal. More than anything, we're motivating one another to accomplish this goal. I try to help him and motivate him to learn. I tell him to seek the This is consistent with some of the earlier gender research on Latino politics. Uh, that shows uh, Latina women, and in this case Mexican Latin women, to be to take have a more collectivist approach to political participation. And if, if if this trend endures, whereby you know women are actively encouraging the men in their social and family networks to naturalize uh, amongst, uh, as they're doing it, that that I think holds implications for um, the Latino naturalization gender gap. Uh, there is a pattern uh, where Latina women are more, much more likely are more likely to naturalize than, than their male counterparts. Um, nevertheless, the, the, again, I want to go back to these, these, this perception of this process as, as institutionally sort of arbitrary and discriminatory because I think that has a lot to do with why migrants retain strong uh, ethnic attachments uh, after, after they complete the process. Um, one of my respondents, the same respondent, offered, offered a very interesting metaphor and I asked her how, you know, how, how she would self-identify, how she would think of herself once, once she obtained U.S. citizenship, once she reached this, this milestone. She says, well, when I'm in the States, I can say that I'm a citizen, but when you're in your country, all it is is a piece of paper that makes you a U.S. citizen. But in reality, you were born in Mexico, and I think you're never going to leave Mexico. It's like a marriage. Even if you're married, you cannot forget about your parents. It's very similar. Even if I become a citizen, I will never forget where I came from. So um, while Mexican migrants may, in effect, be marrying the state, as Placencia argues in his book, uh, 
Here, I make the case that they're doing so without abjuring, without relinquishing ties to the community, communities of origin or country of origin. And in response to the critics of dual nationality who, who argue that this is evidence of civic bigamy, mm -hmm. I argue that, that it's important to unveil and expose the, the naturalization process uh, at, as one that's perceived by uh, a great deal of institutional discrimination and institutional racism. Um, in order to understand why there are, why are these, there are these strong transnational attachments. Um, another way that I try to tap into this in, in the focus groups that I've conducted in these citizenship classrooms is by, by translating this, the naturalization oath, the oath of allegiance that all citizen, you know, citizenship applicants have to take. And in, I translate it into Spanish and I read it out to folks. I ask them what they make of this, of this oath, right? And if, 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 you're from, if you're not familiar with the oath, it, it, it reads something like, I hereby uh, renounce, I, I, I absolutely abjure and relinquish any, any loyalties and fidelities to my previous country and state. So, so it's, it's literally inscribing the, the expectation of singular political loyalties in the U.S. in this oath. And, you know, uniformly, migrants were, were highly critical of this expectation of singular loyalties, precisely because they've exposed this central citizenship contradiction. Here they are in these citizenship classrooms, uh, embracing the principles of American democracy and U.S. constitutionalism, yet they feel that they're not being welcomed as equal citizens, even as they're undergoing this process. Um, so, you know, one respondent uh, in Salinas says, they require us to swear by their country and by their constitution, but at the end of the day, they don't see us as fellow Americans. And perhaps foreshadowing that, that final stage of the migrant political life cycle, one of my male respondents in Salinas, when I asked, you know, how, if they would self-identify as Mexicanos, once they, once they become citizens, he says, well, well, we'll be Mexican until we die and even after we're dead. So, seen in this light, this so-called political baptism uh, gets exposed for, uh, you know, th there's a, a great deal of, of, of bureaucratic arbitrariness in this process. And I argue that rather than seeing it as the political baptism, this may very well turn out to be the consecration of transnational citizens. This is where that process of the thickening of transnational citizenship begins. It's, it's an important part of understanding that process. Um, so, you know, this is the, the consecration of transnational citizenship. Allow me to move to the second, the second uh, phase, the consummation of transnational citizenship, by looking at um, sort of uh, the, 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 the best kind of, or, or perhaps, you know, the migrants who, who arguably best embody that duality. Uh, these return mm -hmm. migrant politicians, these migrant activists, uh, which, which admittedly is a select sort of subsample, right? They're, they're not. This is this is what the, the political participation literature would call the super participants, um, and by that I mean that you know they're not representative of the vast majority of Mexican migrants, but their lives offer a window into understanding that process, the thickening of transnational citizenship, how it is that these folks can cultivate and maintain these strong attachments in both national contexts. Um, so. You know, as I mentioned at the outset, I've, I've worked with these with these uh, candidates in a number of capacities. Um, I've you know shadowed them on the campaign trail. I've interviewed a lot of the the migrant deputies in the state in the state legislature of Zacatecas. Now it's um, there's a migrant quota whereby uh, out of the 30 seats in the in the state legislature, two have to be filled by, by these migrant candidates. So in the, in in this year's election, I've been um, advising and consulting a lot of, and, and doing a lot of campaign strategy for some of these precandidatos. These U.S.-based migrants were, were vying for, um, for uh, the nomination of political parties to, to uh, eventually fill these positions of migrant representation. Um, and as part of that, as part of that work, I, you know, it's been my task to collect the political profiles of these folks, right? And, you know, across the board, these are these are individuals who are fully, fully engaged in their the politics of their home country, of their communities of origin, and also in the civic life uh, of their communities of residence in the United States. So, for example, there's there's a, there's a candidate who, who, who was from San Jose. Actually, he's lived in San Jose for 30 years, and you know, transnationally, he's been he's been involved with the hometown associations. He's he was he was an advisor to the Institute for Mexicans Abroad. He's a co-founder of El Congreso del Pueblo, another transnational organization. But he's also served on a number of campaigns locally in the Bay Area. He's been, you know, on, on mayoral campaigns in the city of Los Baños and and another re uh, mayoral, re mayoral re election campaign in Sunnyvale. He was a key organizer of the 2006 immigrant rights marches in San Jose. He does voter registration drives in San Jose. So it's, you know, across the board, these folks had that, that civic binationality, that, that political bifocality. 
Um, the, you know, the other guy who's sort of a viable candidate now is, is a migrant from Texas, and he's, you know, the president of his HTA club, but he's also, I think, a bilingual ed teacher in his local school in, in Dallas. He's a certified translator in his local schools in Dallas. He's an active member of his people. So again, uh, these these profiles, I think, offer a, a, a window into how this process how how this process unfolds, right? The thickening of transnational citizenship. Um, and so there are a number of patterns that I, that I want to point out in this chapter. What, aside from the obvious one that this is the male-dominated, the male-dominated world of Mexican transnational politics, mm -hmm. all but one of these migrant deputies have been have been men, right? So I see that's you know that's one of the big, big uh, uh, you know uh, critiques from from the you know the, the, the transnational feminist perspective. Um, the, the, the other sort of uh, recurring pattern is that these hometown associations serve as sort of the transnational training grounds. There's the stepping stone for these migrants to become involved in Mexican politics, and I, and I argue also an entry into participation in U.S. civic life as well. Uh, so you know when I when I when I interviewed Rigo Castañeda, who was a migrant deputy for the PRI, uh, he said that what motivates him was to continue working for the migrant causes that had long been part of our struggle. He's making a uh, direct reference to his long trajectory in the, these hometown associations. He was also a past president of the Zacatecas Federation in LA. Um, and his counterpart, the, the migrant deputy for the PRD, Sebastián Martínez, had you know, a similar, similar sort of experience. He said, um, you know, migration was, a, was long a part of his upbringing. He was the son of a former bracero. His older brothers were all migrants. And when he, when he hit adulthood, he said you know, he had to live migration in the flesh. And, he ended up settling in, in, in Dallas, Texas, and ended up becoming an active member of the hometown associations there. And he says that that experience allowed me to take on the responsibility of becoming a migrant deputy based on my familiar, familiarity with the needs of the community. So that transnationality, which oftentimes gets played out in these HTAs, is also um, part of their, of their policy priorities. It's part of their political agenda. It informs the policy work that they're doing as migrant representatives in what I call the diaspora as, di as district approach, whereby these migrant uh, representatives envision their constituencies as, as a cross-border constituency with demands in the community of origin in Mexico and with pressing needs and demands in their, in their communities of residence in the US. Uh, so on the Mexican side, um, you know, Rigo Castañeda says that it's his job to follow up, support, and strengthen migrant investments from this new front, meaning congressional office in Zacatecas. And he cited the, the example of the successful completion of a, an irrigation dam um, in the municipality of Cuchipila in southern Zacatecas, uh, where you know, he attributed this to the work that he's done in his office and the work of his party. Um, Pablo Rodriguez, the current migrant deputy for the, for the PAN, cited his work as focusing on a job creation strategy so that potential migrants can stay in their place of origin. This whole idea of making migration an option and not a necessity is the whole idea behind the right not to migrate. Um, but these migrant officials also were very clear that this cross-border constituency also had pressing needs in their community of settlement in the United States. Oftentimes needs that uh, apply not only to the migrants, but also to the US born children. So Sebastián Martínez cited one of those needs as, as, uh, as being education. Uh, he says, the principal need has to do with education. My work within the migrant associations in Texas allowed me to see that the majority of our youth only obtained high school, uh, high school education. This didn't make sense. <coughs> Therefore, there was a need to motivate students and their parents to make the most of their educational possibilities. So these migrant officials are looking for ways to design policy, you know, policy strategies, policy instruments to meet the needs of this cross-border constituency not only in the communities of origin in Mexico, but also uh, the needs in, in the U.S. So on top of education and you know, providing scholarships for the U.S.-born children of these migrants, um, you know, they also assist them with legal, uh, their legal procedures. They offer legal advice and legal counsel for migrants who are regularizing their immigration status or who are petitioning um, their family members or who are becoming naturalized citizens. So, you know, we have these migrant representatives holding office in, in Mexico and also assisting their, their, their co-nationals or paisanos become further integrated into the U.S., right? So again, I think a, a, an example of that process of the thickening of transnational citizenship. Um, this was also a very good opportunity to ask directly how these folks manage these, these, these dual ties, right? You know, how is it that they have 
you know, full-time family obligations in the U.S. and they hold political office in Mexico. And how is it you know, that this position in Mexico impacts their civic involvement in the U.S.? And I ask folks if they stayed abreast of political developments in the U.S. And by and large, there is this, you know, this this um, cross-border civic synergy or spillover effect, right? We know that political participation is habit-forming, but it's also transferable from one context to the other. Um, people, uh, a lot of these uh, migrant officials expressed that this experience of holding office in Mexico increased their civic interest and political awareness and, and on both sides of the border. Um, so the one kind of anecdotal example that I always like to cite is when I'm, I'm interviewing Diego Castaneda in his congressional office in Zacatecas in the state legislature, you know, I'm asking him if he, may, if he stays abreast of, of you know, electoral politics in the U.S. And he's like, of course. You know, he's like, in the 2008 presidential election, I had to fly back to LA to make sure my family, you know, went out and voted for President for Obama, President Obama at that time. He said, I had five eligible voters in my household who wouldn't vote unless I returned to vote. So as soon as I arrived, I located the polling place, and on election day, I took the entire family to vote. Um, so again, um, it, I think a very interesting window into the, 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 the you know, transnational citizenship to its fullest, to its fullest extent, I guess. Um, Another one of the, the priorities, uh, uh, the policy priorities of these migrant officials has to do with another one of the, the major needs of the, of, the, of the Mexican migrant diaspora. Uh, a very specific need, a very specific form of transnationalism, and that is, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the transnational practice of repatriating the bodies of deceased migrants, migrants who die in the U.S. and are subsequently repatriated to their communities of origin uh, in rural Mexico for, for burial. Um, and you know, that, that segues into the, that final stage of the migrant political life cycle that I call posthumous transnationalism, uh, post-mortem repatriation from the U.S. to Mexico. Um, and I want to just underscore that this, this practice hasn't been strictly confined to, um, you know, migrants who tragically die in attempted surreptitious um, border crossings into the U.S. Uh, so on top of, you know, the, the migrants who die at the border, there are thousands of, you know, either recently arrived or in some cases long, long-term and fully settled migrants who live in the U.S. and who die in the U.S. but are subsequently repatriated. They also form part of this posthumous return migration. Now, there are a wide variety of circumstances under which these repatriations occur, and the deceased repatriates themselves span the full gamut of legal statuses afforded to migrants in the U.S. legal economy. You know, undocumented migrant, legal permanent resident, naturalized U.S. citizen. And you know, in most cases, this is a network-driven phenomenon whereby the family in the U.S. or in Mexico, you know, decides to repatriate a deceased loved one. Uh, yet, in other circumstances, it's the expressed desire of migrants in life to be returned to the community of origin and death. When the return in life is uncertain, there's this whole sort of collective expression in the transnational imaginaries of Mexican migrants about, you know, being returned to the community of origin even after death. Um, you know, there's, there's, again, there's this whole migrant mythology about this issue. And I, I argue it's a recurring theme in the transnational cultural memory and the transnational cultural production of migrants. And in the chapter, I go into that, you know, I, I look at, um, you know, what I see as one of the most useful social texts to get at this migrant music, Mexican regional music, and this recurring theme of a return to the community of origin, even after that. Um, but for, for, for in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about briefly talk about the, the, the institutional side of the story, which is how the Mexican government sees this, this process and how they've increasingly institutionalized this process and even you know, subsidized it. Uh, because I think that's an important part of understanding this, this process of the thickening of transnational citizenship. So I targeted um, uh, key bureaucratic actors at different levels of governance who are directly involved in this practice, right? At the transnational level, I interviewed the consular staff person at the Mexican consulate in LA to understand a little bit about the logistics uh, behind the process and also to understand how these bureaucratic actors see this, this practice. Uh, so the, the, this staff person said, well, given the demand and thanks to the consul's efforts, a partnership was established with several mortuaries in LA, in LA County. Um, this is the only consulate with such an agreement. So the, the Mexican consulates usually partner up with these local funeral homes who then offer an affordable repatriation service where you know, they take care of everything from the embalming of the body to its transportation to an international airport for subsequent repatriation. Um, now, on top of this, there are now uh, specific funds in the consular budgets uh, destined for this practice, right? And partly owing to this, 
this staff person felt that um, that explained part that partly explained why migrants engaged in this process to begin with, right? So he he kind of dismissed a lot of the social networks kind of cultural side of the story. He said, well, some people say it was his or her last wish to be buried in the community of birth, but I believe that one of the reasons why they don't bury them in the U.S. is simply the costs. It's much more expensive to bury them here, partly because you know again this is, this is subsidized. Um, this was a, a very different view from some of the other actors I, that I interviewed, uh, particularly at, this, at the state level. So you know, scaling down to the state level of governance, one of the sites that I targeted to understand this process uh, was uh, the International Airport in Zacatecas. That's the main port of entry. Uh, this was the first airport in the country to uh, appoint a, medic, uh, a medical doctor to a staff to oversee and administer the arrival of these cadavers that are arriving on these international flights. And um, you know, the, the 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 staff person says previously there was no such coordination or no established protocol. Now there's a cross-border commitment on behalf of the actors involved in carrying out these repatriations on the U.S. side and those receiving the bodies on the Mexican side. So ironically, part part of this task was to sort of document the dead and make sure that these bodies arrived with you know the consular note, the death certificate. Um, and you know, even though the, this particular uh, uh, bureaucratic actor had a very different understanding of this process from the previous one, he also sort of made sure to acknowledge his political superiors. Right? He said that this was sort of a sensibility of the of the then governor Amalia Garcia, who was you know making you know who was providing the support for these families uh, to make sure that they, they can repatriate their deceased loved ones, um, because sometimes they didn't have the the resources to carry out these these repatriations. Um, this actor again attributed uh, the uh, or identified the cultural considerations behind this behind this practice. Uh, in contrast, in sharp contrast to the previous uh, the, the bureaucrat at the Mexican consulate in LA, he says to leave a loved one in a distant place once he or she is dead would be like never accepting their death. Repatriation allows the family to share the last moment with the body, the velorio or the wake, attended by the deceased family, friends, and neighbors before burying him or her in the land and the land of their birth oftentimes next to the tombs of their ancestors. They, the family, don't accept the person as dead until they have the body with them. So th these, these very contrasting um, uh, accounts of this process um, were, were, to me, there was no better way to sort of understand that than by interviewing uh, at the federal level uh, Andres Bermudez, one of the, one of the pioneering uh, return migrant politicians. So, this is, this is someone who was you know, a lifelong resident of the small town of Winters, California, over by Sacramento. And he was one of, the first, one of the first to be elected mayor of his hometown in Mexico. And when I interviewed him to get his sense of, of this particular practice, he was a federal congressman. He had been elected to Mexico federal congress. And in this, posi in this position, he, he um, lobbied for additional funds for conflicts in the US uh, for these repatriations. And when I asked him what his fellow congressman in Mexico City thought of this, uh, of, of this priority of his, he says, many of them didn't agree with the destination of these funds because, to put it simply, they don't know what it means to be a migrant. They need to know what it's like to be a migrant, what it's like to have your son, your brother, or your father's body arrive so that it can be buried in, in his colonia or pueblo, along with his other family members. Um, it's interesting that Bermudez sort of imagines these deceased repatriates as male migrants, and he sort of frames <laughs> His policy work with emotional appeals to grieving mothers in the hometown, um, but I, I think this also speaks to that disconnect bet uh, between the Mexican migrant diaspora and the elite political class that runs their country. Um, and he really sort of ended ended the, inter the interview by underscoring that point. He says, "I'm here to represent my people. I always tell elite politicians that in order to do away with migration, they need to have the migrants themselves. I'm tired of hearing politicos talk about migration this, migration that." Know it, live it, in order to do away with it. Nobody can do away with that which they have not felt. Mm -hmm. um, so again, um, this sort of institutional side of the story, I think, says a lot about this process of the thickening of transnational citizenship. Because ironically, uh, I think it's it looks very similar on, in, in both national contexts. In many ways, I think it's the f the 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 sending state and the receiving state's failure to effectively capture the loyalties of migrants, to effectively include these migrants into their respective polities that leads migrants to seek these forms of transnational membership and transnational belonging. So migrants, I think, are actively looking for ways to go from essentially a position of uh, double disenfranchisement to a position of double militancy, as my colleague Jonathan Fox called it. Um, so 
I'm virtually out of time, but allow me to just wrap up by highlighting some of the, what I think are the, the, the contributions that I'm trying to make, and, and also by, by citing Octavio Paz, because I always want to finish with something like this. Uh, in a literary essay on the work of Mexican poet Ramon Lopez Velarde, the uh, early 20th century poet who was born in the now migrant city municipality of Jerez, Octavio Paz describes the recurring theme of the hometown as a magnetic field to which the author returns time and time again without ever returning fully. As it turns out, this is an apt allegory for understanding the role that the homeland plays in contemporary Mexican migrants' transnational lives and identities. By tracing transnationalism across the migrant political life cycle, I try to make a number of contributions. On the one hand, this manuscript challenges the linear logic of the neo-assimilationists, or the, the critics of transnationalism, who argue that the US continues to successfully integrate its immigrants, uh, effectively securing singular political loyalties from them, by exposing and pointing out the institutional racism that characterizes and impedes the process of migrant integration. On the other hand, it also challenges the continuous circularity of the transnationalism perspective, which depicts migrants as doubly ambivalent about their sense of belonging in their country of settlement and their country of origin, construing them as being neither here nor there. The latter is reminiscent of Bassa's metaphor of the magnetic field to which migrants return time and time again without ever returning fully. As my manuscript shows, Mexican migrants in the US are tenaciously transnational in life and in death, to conclude, in the words of Paz, like in the poetics of Lopez Velarde, for many Mexican migrants, only death can, quote, provide the sense of totality that is perpetually denied to us by time. Thank you. So I'd like to hear your questions, comments. Or exists in the second or third generation? Um, second is, um, if you could give us more of the content of these migrant mythologies, uh, I'm really curious and hearing a little bit more of the substance of what those are. And then last, um, I'm wondering if you write about, or uh, how much you've thought about, the extent to which your research troubles you know, traditional notions of the nation state. And so what sorts of um, implications or suggestions are there for you know, the continued existence of the state or um, the possibility of alternative notions of nationhood. Um, obviously, it troubles boundaries, very you know. So I'm curious about the, your thoughts on those issues as well. Yeah, okay, great questions. Um, uh, the first issue, uh, you know, the, the durability of transnational ties across generations. And, you know, we were having this conversation over lunch. Uh, empirically, yeah, there are a number of surveys that look at, you know, uh, you know what, is, what, is, what do these trans, trans border, transnational attachments look like over generations? And, and in fact, the, there's a sharp decline over generations and over time. Right? But I think that in many ways can be an artifact, as, as Lisa was pointing out, you know, over lunch. It can be an artifact of, you know, who these, who it's, you know, it's a, it's a cross section of folks who arrive in a particular time period. So that, that, that may not necessarily, it's, that, that trend might not endure. Uh, with with uh, well, people like myself, you know, the, you know, in my generation, or the children of Mexican migrants. Uh, I think what I'm trying to do in this project is also help us re-envision, re-imagine these transnational attachments in, in a way that hasn't, I think, fully been captured in existing studies. Uh, something like, you know, posthumous repatriation uh, can can be sort of a, a pathway to prolonging these types of attachments, right? In a very different, you know, in a very social, familial, cultural way, that that oftentimes is not fully really accounted for in, in these different metrics that we have in our survey data, right? You know, how often, you know, what are the measures of transnationalism in our in our surveys? It's like how often do you call home? How, how often do you send money back home? How often? So these very discrete variables. So here, I think it's paying uh, closer attention precisely to these mythologies, these migrant to the cultural production and um, the socio-cultural dimensions of transnationalism. Which leads to your second question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned the mythologies at the front end of the life cycle, and there I meant, you know, the collective kind of understanding how migrants see certain institutional uh, procedures uh, like citizenship acquisition, and how the, these perceptions of institutional discrimination inform uh, their, their their strong ethnic identification and attachments um, throughout. So this is you know, I call it a, a collective mythology because it's it's informed by what people hear from their, their bisonos who have not, you know, navigated these procedures. Um, 
at, at the at the back end of the life cycle when it comes to posthumous repatriation, again, that that's what initially piqued my interest in this topic was precisely that disjunction. When I was reading in the literature uh, on transnationalism, the so-called mythical <laughs> turn, right, this idea that yeah, sure, migrants always say that they're going to go back, but they don't, right? They end up living here. Um, and, you know, the, what immediately sort of came to my mind is like, well, sure, you can have migrants who are, by every measure, fully uh, integrated in the U.S. They've lived here for 30 years, they, they, they've raised their children here, they're, they're, they're naturalized, they're, they're homeowners here. But yet, when they die, they want to be buried in the community of origin. Mm -hmm. And so, what, 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 what does this mean for, um, you know, uh, political uh, belonging and membership, right? Uh, and so that's that's that cultural production is, is what initially sort of got got me interested in that in that particular uh, process. Uh, but of course, you know, as a political scientist, I have to sort of document the role of the state and institutions and so forth. But I think both are very important to understanding um, that 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 the, thick, the thickening of transnational citizenship. Um, the third question uh, is: This evidence of sort of um, post-national post-national citizenship or post-national identity. You know, I, I don't I don't fully I don't fully um, buy the whole the, the post national kind of citizenship critique, uh, mainly because one one has to take seriously the resiliency and the continued power of state of nation states and of state actors, right? I mean, literally, we're talking even in this process. This is really I think uh, an attempt of on the part of the Mexican government at capturing these loyalty by throwing money at this at this process. So state the state I think. You know the, the declining significance of the state argument. I think is is, is not entirely uh, is, is is perhaps a little premature. Uh, and, and is this evidence of a sort of you know um, you know uh, post national type of identities or citizenship formations? I don't know. I mean, I think these are these are attachments that are ethno territorial attachments that are anchored to an unambiguous <coughs> territorial locality and its attendant political community in rural Mexico, right? So it's. That's still within the orbit of the nation state, right? Now, I don't, I don't argue that that's, that's an expression of loyalty to the Mexican government. It's not. It's an expression of loyalty to that political community, right? So this is why I say that this is actually evidence of the utter failure of both the sending state and the receiving state of effectively capturing the loyalties of these miners and effectively including them and their political communities. Um, so, yeah. great questions. Sandy. Thank you so much, and thanks for in this work. Um, I was really intrigued by um, you shining that light on um, the HTAs and the associations as really incubators for political activism on both sides. Um, of course, pretty much from what we know so far, from what you suggested, it's primarily men. Right? Um, I'm, uh, you know, think back on what was the avenue for political participation and involvement by women in this country you know, post World War II, and one really important incubator for women were the local school boards. That's where they start to get their, you know, practice really get get some traction, and, and you know, as an avenue into political involvement. So I'd love to have, hear more. If you've gotten into this, how much that holds, how many really do this, and do you see any? opening for women um, through the HDAs, or do they have to go through some other kind of yeah. organizational structure to really start to enter politics? Yeah, no, um, there's a, uh, I, I do have another, I have another chapter in the, in the book project that, you know, a quantitative survey-based chapter, where I, where I, you know, I, I try to assess whether or not these HTA membership and participation in HTA that does in fact you know, correlate positively with engagement, other forms of civic engagement in the U.S. And you know, and, and these models, these statistical models, surprisingly across the board, that's that's always a, you know, a significant finding. The HTA membership uh, is, in fact, sort of um, uh, a spring, a stepping stone into participation in Mexican politics, but also it sort of sort of spills over into you know civic engagement in the U.S. Um, the the issue of gender within these within these migrant associations that you know I, I think or sorry I skipped over another point that you raised that what 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 percentage uh, of of the migrant population participates in these organizations uh, it's it's minimal right 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 it's 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 you know we know that transnationalism is in fact a minoritarian affair right and part of one of the sort of subtexts that I'm trying to work through in this in the book is um, well, 
where does that leave other forms of transnational of other expressions of transnationality, like like this practice, right? The desire to return, even when even when these migrants may have not been in participatory in these other forms of transnationalism. Uh, you know, I was I was talking to you earlier about um, one of, one of the leading scholars in, in Mexico uh, on this on this topic has sort of made the the argument that uh, in order to have these these rights and entitlements, migrants should be expected to be fully participatory, right? So if you're not a member of an HTA, why should you have this, this sort of right and entitlement of belonging? I think that's, that's, that's uh, entirely uh, inaccurate, right? Because the vast majority of folks don't have the time and resources to be participatory, to be engaged in these, in these organizations. Uh, so yeah, it's a very select subsample of, of folks who participate in, in, in them. And, and there, yes, there are a lot of gender issues in these organizations. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, the, the, so the, the migrants I'm working with now, you know, helping them with their campaign strategy and so forth, um, there was, it's, it, they're all but one are, are male. And the one female candidate, um, she, she's, 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 she's the president of her hometown association in, in Las Vegas. She lives in, Ve in Vegas. She was accused of being an escort and was, and was, and there was a video circulating online, it was all over the, the Mexican media, even the national media. And, and so she was disqualified because of moral uh, turpitude. And what was the response of the guys that I'm working with? They didn't want to be associated with those accusations of immorality. And I told them, you gotta be more concerned about being accused of being a machista, you know, <laughs> which is a very serious, serious accusation of these organizations because in fact, they are now dominated. And a lot of the, a lot of the qualitative ethnographic studies on these orgs have really, have really showed, uh, shed light on that. Um, uh, yeah, so are there spaces opening up? I mean, I think I, there are a, a, a handful of very dedicated and, and vocal and militant women who are, who are rightfully um, uh, struggling for, for, for gender representation in these spaces, um, but it's, it's, it's a struggle. Right? Because that's one one dimension of Mexican political culture that unfortunately is being reproduced, mm -hmm. among others. I had a similar question, so, and it's about gender, but it's about how it's working on a process with the black cycle. It seems that it's it's in that one moment you just talked about it. it you know, it's milk coming right, but the citizenship, the baptism, and then death, it seems to be something a little different. So, what you could sort of yeah, tell us about how that comes. How that works. Yeah, there's absolutely, there's sort of gender manifests itself and plays out very differently across these different stages, right? In each chapter, I think there's sort of a, a very strong gender dimension, um, which, I, which I'm still kind of working through, but right? maybe early on, I hadn't fully kind of I'll flesh that out. Um, you know, in the citizenship chapter, um, you know, there, there is, you know, oftentimes it's, it's, it's mainly women in these citizenship classrooms, and we're taking a very different kind of approach and understanding uh, to political participation uh, and and to um, what that means for their for their families and, and you know as they become uh, further integrated in the U.S. but also maintain these transnational uh, uh, identifications. Um, in, you know, in, in, in the in the repatriation chapter, um, there's you know there's a very important concept uh, by the political sociologist Lynn Goldring. Of gendered memory, right? Whereby, to what extent are these recollections of the rural community of origin uh, mediated by the gender dynamics they're in, right? So those, those are very differently from from the perspective of female migrants who may associate, you know, their memories of the of the community of origin may be associated with, you know, surveillance and the social sanctions uh, uh, reserved uh, reserved for behavior that's deviant from you know rancho norm normativity. And so, so Lynn Goldman argues that that actually explains why female migrants are more likely to to take uh, to want to actively integrate into the U.S. Um, and that's only further strengthened by you know life life experiences. They have children here. They want to remain closer to their children, their grandchildren, and and, and and that sort of partly explains these kind of divergent um, return ideologies, right? Uh, and, and Empirically, the, 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 the repatriation uh, process is, is heavily male. Uh, the, the data that I have on it is, is um, well, it's, it's hard to have, I don't have sort of comprehensive data, so we have sort of just snapshots. Uh, I, I did sort of archival work in, in one region, 
and the split there was like 70, 70, 30, 70 percent male migrants. And I think that I think that's true overall of this process. Um, so yeah, uh, gender has. Uh, I'm still sort of working through these different the different the different ways in which gender is playing out at these different stages of the migrant political life cycle, and what it means for incorporation. I'm just curious to know if you were able to gain any insight on the general sentiment of like the actual individuals that live in these pueblos. For example, are they accepting of these candidates, migrant candidates, mm -hmm. um, and specifically maybe um, for mayor, um, yeah. president of the pueblo, what was yeah. the general sentiment? Yeah, I mean, by and large, the reason why these, these migrant candidates have been so successful was because they, they've, they have found a huge political following. Mm -hmm. And I think that really speaks to um, the the political um, um, uh, you know cynicism that exists among the Mexican citizen, citizenry, particularly in rural regions, where where you know uh, old fashioned clientelistic Mexican politics has been has been the mainstay, right? Uh, uh, and so the, the, this new political subjectivity of the migrant turned politician emerges as as sort of the the anti the anti politician, right? This is these are literally the folks who were uprooted from these from from these places now returning to do politics differently, uh, presumably, right? Because then we have the whole gender issues and and really you know allegations of corruption and clientelism are still very 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 active in these organizations. So a lot of it gets reproduced, but it, but but there 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 has been a very significant uh, electoral following for these candidates now. Uh, the 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 migrant deputies that have been the quotas that were established in the state legislature, those are proportional representation seats. So it's the political parties that have to nominate these these candidates. So it's not a direct le election, popular vote. Uh, and what's happening now, part of what I'm what I'm advising these 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 candidates on is we're seeing um, a classic you know Mexican political um, corruption and really the utter what I call I'm calling calling it to token transnational. We're seeing the utter usurpation of this category, the migrant deputy, where the parties are nominating career politicians who are only nominally migrants because they have a family member here or come here for, to shop or something, you know? <laughs> and so like that makes them migrants now, and they're, and they're now being nominated for these positions of migrant deputies and, and being portrayed as bona fide migrants. And so, so there's, there's, you know, but when there has been a direct election or, or, or popular vote for a migrant candidate, They've been, I think, um, you know, they've launched pretty competitive campaigns. Uh, the one that I, the one that I worked on, Lupe Gomez, uh, you know, objectively speaking, as someone who's you know trained in political science and knows something about campaign strategy, he ran a very effective campaign. And actually, had very, very, had almost nothing to do with that. He designed, you know, very effective campaign speeches and strategy. And you know, he, he in in most of the polling, he was he was leading throughout the race. It, and, and and he ended up third on election day. So, you know, amidst wide allegations and evidence of, of, of corruption and vote buying and so forth. So, you know, I think these folks are, are forced to be reckoned with in Mexican politics, but uh, there are a lot of institutional barriers and, and obstacles, uh, aside from uh, the fact that it's a very delimited and small number of people, right, um, who are willing to take on this. You know, when I, I, I keep in touch with Lupe and I, and I ask him if he's going to give it another attempt, and he says, well, you know, why, 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 you know, run the personal risk? There's all these, you know, this is, he really, it was, it, it, it was a very disappointing experience, even from his own party, uh, who didn't, at the end of the day, fully, fully support him, uh, financially and otherwise. So I think there are a lot of challenges, but I think that this is, it's an important trend and precedent that's being established, and that's being, Constitutionalized, institutionalized in many ways, and you know, to what degree is this going to endure is an open question, right? But I think it's 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 now it's now there, and, and it's an important um, it's an important present. There's one question here. Yeah, I see that you focus a lot on um, the experience of uh, adults migrants and do you have any ideas or thoughts on the transnational experience of Mexican youth? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I, you know, I have to, when, when people have asked me, like, which sort of generation, which cohort of migrants does this book really speak to? Right? And I think I've come to realize that I'm only talking about my parents' generation, I think, right? Because I think um, 
uh, the, 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 you know, the youth, the, the, up and, the up and coming generations, I think, have a, obviously a very different relationship to, to these transnational, uh, transnational engagements. That said, I would argue that this generation, the US born children of migrants, Mexican migrants today, is a lot different from the, the, the so called Mexican American generation, the Chicano generation, that was the product of the first big wave of Mexican migrants, right? Um, there, there was basically, uh, or, or, or by and large, a, a straight line assimilation or integration, I should say, not assimilation, integration process for those Mexican youth, right? That became the Mexican American and Chicano generation, which in, in, in some ways, uh, some, some grad students are documenting how, how that historically, how those, that generation maintained strong transnational attachments. But by and large, those folks, those transnational ties, they, they, they declined. And there are a number of political and economic factors that have to do with that, obviously. But today, I think these other forms of transnational engagements uh, resonate uh, in a very different way with, with today's youth. Um, you know, to what degree will that carry forward? I, mean, I don't doubt that that will continue being a minoritarian affair, right? The degree to which these youth may maintain these strong attachments, um, and that it possibly may decline. But understanding understanding the, the nuances and the complexities of it, I think. Um, you know, we have to do justice to that, to that, uh, to that process. Um, to what degree it'll be, you know, carried forward, I think. I, for my personal opinion, I think that's that's an uh, it's an historical obligation that all of us have. I mean, my U.S.-born children of Mexican migrants is 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 an obligation that they have to uh, to maintain uh, a strong political engagement on both sides. Who knows? Who? <laughs> uh, quick questions. Um, I'm interested in funding. So all these um, all these political processes that you describe, either hometown associations or the actual candidates, how are they funded, or how? Um, if you can give me some details about that, I'm really interested. Also, aside from being a transnational ethnographic study, I'm really interested in the fact that in, on each side of the, of the two nations, you seem to be doing a very trans-local. Um, and so there's all these interlinkages. And if you can speak about some of the possible um, generative um, things that have been happening in these translocal things within particular nation states. Like you talk about Las Vegas, or you talk about Los Angeles, possibly now Bay Area, Las La Salinas, and if that's sort of generating something that you see as uh, maybe a, a next project or something that you cover in yeah. your book. Okay, well, okay. Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the funding, um, yeah, that, that's been a, a really tricky sort of logistical administrative issue, right? Because these, these hometown associations, uh, they're not profit, they're not profit, they're NGO, they're not profit organizations. So they can't, be, they can't explicitly become involved in these political campaigns, mm -hmm. right? Even though a lot of their, a lot of these candidates are coming out of the, they're emerging from the ATAs, uh, but there's no sort of direct uh, campaign or funding support for them there. So mo most of the time, uh, they're you know endorsed by the parties in Mexico. Uh, to the extent that they are receiving some degree of financial support, but it's been very limited. So, in the experience of, uh, so there, so there's, you know, political parties are 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 are, are paying, are, are, you know, talking the talk, saying, yeah, sure, we welcome and we embrace migrants, but but one of the ways that they're that they're that they're uh, that their actions speak uh, to the contrary is when they're not fully supporting, them. they're not fully um, nominating migrants to electable positions, they're not fully fi fi you know, funding and financing their campaigns. Uh, in Lupe Gomez's campaign, you know, towards the end of it, they basically stopped, the, the funds stopped coming in. So it's like, he had to cover expenses out of pocket. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, mean, that, that, I think that's one good, very good way to look at um, the challenges of these transnational political campaigns and to what degree, to what degree Mexican political institutions are really, are really fun, are really supportive of this, right? You know, if, you know, show me the money. It's, and, and by and large, that, that, that support has been very, very minimal. Um, translocal, translocal uh, connections. I mean, I think, I think any, any, any study, well, I think this, this might, uh, well, actually, no, I, I, will, I, I do think that any study of transnational, of, the, of these type of transnational connections has to take a translocal approach in many ways, right? There, there is now sort of an emerging literature that, that sort of scales up and looks at, you know, supranational types of uh, migrant organizing. There's another point that we talked about over lunch, you know, where 
you know, it becomes a cross-national effort around this idea of, of, of migrants, of being a migrant. This idea of, there's an organization called United International mm -hmm. that, that tries to build solidarity and alliances um, uh, using this identity of the migrant as sort of the, the new vanguard class internationally, right? Uh, so it's the struggle between transnational labor and transnational capital. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you scale up from these trans, from the translocal level and, and forge these solidarities and alliances cross nationally, right? Mm -hmm. Between migrants from different across the global south, migrants from Latin America, migrants from Southeast Asia. Um, and that's an important political project, right? That's that's um, but I don't think that 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 the lived experiences of migrants uh, sort of uh, necessarily scales up in the same way, right? So they're these lives are still very much anchored in these translocal connections, right? The community of origin. Now, now that 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 point might be contingent on which is contingent on the cultural specificity of which case we're talking about. And in, in the Mexican case, um, I, I would argue that um, one needs to take the, the translocal approach. And you know, to what degree empirically we assess the, the variations involved in that? You know, how does a, a classic uh, immigrant gateway like LA, LA lends itself for these trans translocal connections versus, you know, perhaps a more rural setting like Salinas or something. That's that's uh, sure to have some important variations. Um, you know, just to cite one example in the ethnographic field work that I did for the repatriation chapter. Um, you know, I focused on on two uh, communities of origin. In, in the state of Zacatecas, one which was one which has like a, a very long history of international migration, you know, over over a century of sustained migration, you know, doc, fully documented and studied, and, and another region that, that has only see, seen mass mi out migration since the, the 1980s, um, and those two communities had very different settlement and destination patterns. So the folks in the the recent migrant center region settled in in South Texas, and their social networks were, were a lot thinner, were, which were, were less established than the folks who were coming from this tradition of these transnational communities. And coordinating a transnational, a bureaucratically complex process like repatriating the deceased level was, was significantly harder for these folks because they lacked the resources, they lacked the, the knowledge, they lacked the wherewithal to even how to logistically carry out these process. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I, st I started off by saying the significance of place, you know, the significance of these translocal collections. That that will determine, or that has a lot to do with the, the density and the robustness, the thickness of the so social networks. Mm -hmm. um, but increasingly, you're you're starting to see all these interconnections because these organizations, these HTAs, are beginning to create those linkages. You know, from LA, Vegas, Texas, Chicago, they're all sort of beginning to in interconnect. But those that that terrain, that sort of Cartography of immigrant settlement looks very different depending on the year. Um, Adrian, this one? Yeah. Uh, well, my question was um, she made a point too that the transnational actually affects the youth as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of youth, I, I just came from a high school, that's why. Um, mm -hmm. There was this one girl, super sweet, she was asking me questions about like um, how is education possible in the United States for an immigrant. Right. And um, there's a lot of them who want to go back as well to work in politics. And um, I really don't know how to answer that because I know how corrupt the systems are over there. You want to go back to Mexico and work? Um, when I was talking about them, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's kind of difficult to respond to them to tell them, all right, so like there's a lot of possibilities, even though like I understand that the systems are not so well grounded. Mm -hmm. So like I don't know what to tell them. Or I don't know what to say to them. The, the Salvadoran case, man, that that is the that's like that's the, the that's the model. I mean, you familiar with Usel? Are oh, yeah. you remember Usel? Uh, recently. Okay. Okay. I mean, Usel, Usel is like the you know the, the perfect example of that of the, having you know U.S. born youth, children or in, in, in this case Salvadoran youth, um, fully engaged, right, and, and transnationally engaged on both sides, right, um, you know, doing literacy campaigns in El Salvador in the summers. Uh, you know, and then also doing the campaign now that now you guys can vote for the first time from abroad in the presidential election in El Salvador, and the youth component of that has been very strong, right? As as as, as far as I can tell, one of my colleagues at UC Santa Cruz, Hector Bella, is has been you know a, a leading figure in that. And I think um, you know, ironically, it's like 
all every Latin American country takes after Mexico for their models of written sending and all this stuff. I, I think the Salvadoran community is a, it should be the, the example of how to maintain these transnational ties and really transnational political agitation, particularly among the youth. <coughs> that's a personal point. Because <coughs> I actually want to, um, uh, I hope to go back when it's possible, because I can't write out at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, I don't want to get into politics because I, I know it doesn't, it doesn't do much. And so what I decided to do is like become a mechanical engineer and work with a lot of purification over there. Let's see, that, like, those are the points that I can't emphasize to students when I go there, but it makes sense. That's, you know, one way to do it is that, that bring back that human capital. Yeah, exactly. Technology transfers, as Sandy has written her. Yeah. So absolutely. We have time for one more. Final question? Final question? Over here? The, 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 the half hand? Oh, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. I'm so oh, go ahead. Oh, no. I mean, she, her hand was up first. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just asking. Come on, don't I'm very new to this. Uh, thank you so much for your Yeah, 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 no, that, that's, that's a great point. I, I, in the chapter, I have a whole section on the citizenship classroom as a counter public, right? And I mm -hmm. call it that precisely because th it becomes the site where migrants are collectively, and again, these are, it, most of these classrooms that I've, that I've worked in, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly female. Mm -hmm. right? And it becomes a site where, where these migrants um, collectively uh, navigate nat naturalization in their own cultural and political terms and expose, again, that central citizenship contradiction. Um, so it's a counterpublic insofar as it, that narrative gets circulated and, and, and shared. Um, you know, it, again, it's, it's, it's one of those arguments where you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that, that then, you know, that, they're, that the, the, these migrants are taking this sort of anti-integration anti or anti-American perspective, but really just kind of exposing uh, that that's the, that citizenship, citizenship contradiction. So it's, it's really kind of, uh, I think, a good way to respond to the, the critics of, of dual nationality who kind of bemoan that this is um, undermining singular loyalty to the U.S. and that this is civic bigamy. And because I, you know, I think in, if, you are, if, if, if we're, we're going to understand those transnational attachments, we have to um, uh, document how that, that procedure is seen as as, as arbitrary. And so there's, there's very little, uh, it's, it's hard to, to acquire the data that shows rejection rates, people who are turned down. Um, but we do know that, that rejection rates have been on the rise mm -hmm. from the mid-1990s to the present. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, not a, it's not a post September 11th thing, right? It, it actually starts with the, with the big surge following yeah. the mid-1990s. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it'd be interesting to see if, we, you know, if there's certain migrant groups that are disproportionately turned away or rejected. Mm -hmm. um, Lewis and Mary did a study of that in the and they did find Mexicans were the most likely to be rejected mm -hmm. of any group. And I doubt that it's changed. Yeah. yeah. I, I can dig it out. Mm -hmm. so we'll start. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, people who think it's unfair, it's for a reason. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's probably justified as, you know, they, they, don't, know, they don't have English fluency. Right. They don't have, but, you know, mm -hmm. does this yeah. work? Well, they have complete discretion. Right, they have, have discretionary, discretionary powers. That's and why they marry so much. Well, and I don't know. My, you know, I'm used to all the cranky folks in LA. I don't know if I told you my husband was at least naturalized in Connecticut. And uh, if anyone's been to the Rabal building in LA, like they treat you, oh, they yeah. treat you like any monk, right? Like any, right? Oh, like they, they, oh. they're awful. I mean, they're oh, just yeah. rude. They're horrible. They're unpleasant. They're unhelpful. We went to Hartford, and I walked in the office, and he said, because I was just waiting, and he said, "Gee, would you like a glass of water?" <laughs> yeah, you know, and I was kind of like, are we in the right office? Like, is this is immigration? Because I've never, like, it was absolutely, it was amazing. And so I think a lot of it also has to do with where you, which offices you go to, how busy they are, 
what the culture is, right? There's a lot of institutional inconsistency mm -hmm. and variability here. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. same thing with like the Mexican consulate. You know, they have all yeah. you know, <laughs> some of them are notoriously yeah. bad. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you will all join me in thanking Dr. Trace. <laughs>